Hey guys, it's Orn Lu, and with the Dynasties of India DLC almost upon us, we have our new civs that we're all excited for, but that doesn't mean we can forget about all of the other civilizations in the game, and there are a ton of balance changes for existing civilizations that will be coming alongside this DLC. It's not part of the DLC, like the patch applies to everybody, but it's coming out at the same time. And so I tried my best to comb through the game and the Genie Editor to see how many changes have been made. Um, as I just indicated, there isn't really a full patch notes list for me or anyone else anywhere. So this is just me combing through the game and seeing what differences there were. So what I will talk about in this video might not necessarily be a comprehensive list, um, but if there are any changes that I overlooked, I'll be sure to post them in a pinned comment below the video, so be sure to check that out uh, if I indeed missed anything. Now, with that said, there are plenty of changes here to talk about, so let's just get right into it. I know people have already been uh, seeing some hints of stuff here and there, but uh, I think you'll still find some surprises in this video. So starting with the general changes, we are actually with the Watchtower, the Humble Feudal Age Watchtower and Dark Age. So as you can see right there, there is now 850 HP for Watchtowers in the Dark and Feudal Age. Dark Age Watchtowers, you can't build them, but you do start with them on maps like Fortress. Now, it was 700 before, so the original value for Watchtower HP was 1,020 which is still the HP value they have when hitting the Castle Age, but now you're pretty much splitting the difference between the 700 and the uh, 1020 HP markers. And this is important, not just in tower rushing, although it is certainly relevant in tower rushing, but for defending your base in Feudal Age against a Castle Age opponent. Now, yes, somebody who's in the Castle Age is supposed to have a big advantage over somebody in the Feudal Age, but there were so many instances at really all levels of play where somebody was slower to Castle Age and trying to defend against especially Mangonel pressure, and those Feudal Age watchtowers just did not stand up well enough to just a few Mangonel shots. And now, you know, these towers are going to be at least a little bit tougher, but notably once you hit Castle Age, they go right back to 1020 HP. So all of that is the same. This is only a change in the uh, Dark and Feudal Age. And yes, this will make Tower Rush play a little bit better, but I think it's going to be more relevant in terms of just defending against uh, Mangonels in early Castle Age. And also this applies to all civs in case I didn't make that clear. Our second sort of general change is going to, act to actually be the Camel Line. And these guys will now have one more line of sight. So they used to have the same line of sight as knights, which was four tiles, aka they're blind. Now camels are actually seeing a little bit further, and I think this was done in part because of the uh, Grijadas and their camel scout, uh, and trying to probably keep that consistent across the unit. But even for all of the other camel civilizations, like, say, Berbers, this is still pretty relevant. Camels are not great raiding units in general, but they have high speed and high HP, so they're at least decent enough, and perhaps you can maybe avoid some engagements you would otherwise, you know, accidentally run into. So it's just a little bit of a buff to camels everywhere, and I, I think that's totally fine. Camels, now they are seeing a bit further, five tile line of sight radius as opposed to four. Our last general change is actually to the Heavy Scorpion. Now they have 8 Pierce Armor as opposed to 7, so that does keep them in line with uh, Siege Onagers, actually. Now, uh, it used to be regular Scorpions had 7 Pierce Armor, Heavy Scorpions had 7 Pierce Armor, so now you do get a little bit more of a buff from that Imperial Age tech. Personally, I think that the Heavy Scorpion could still use a little bit more love, because Castle Age Scorpions we see all the time, it's just the Heavy Scorpion is just nowhere near as useful, generally speaking, compared to Onagers, Rams, Siege Onagers, Siege Rams, that whole sort of thing, especially Bombard Cannons as well. So does this make the Heavy Scorpion a bit more viable in the Imperial Age? Yes, it does make them more resistant to arrow fire, especially, you know, Arbalests, Heavy Cav Archers. Dealing one less damage is very relevant when the units are only dealing like 2-3 damage anyway. But I still don't think this like fundamentally alters the role of the Heavy Scorpion in your uh, late game armies. So those are the uh, general changes for all of the civilizations. Now, I found 12 civilizations that received specific changes. So yeah, there's going to be some fun stuff here, guys. 
And first of those is actually going to be the Berbers, and that change is going to be to the Genitor unique unit. Now they only cost 40 food as opposed to 50 food. So the unit used to be 50 food, 35 wood, now it's 40 food, 35 wood, and... What this does is it makes the Genitor a little bit more attractive, especially in that, uh, you know, early to mid Castle Age time frame when food is at a premium because you're trying to get technologies and add in villagers and all that stuff. And it might make the unit just a bit more common against some uh, foot archer sieves like, say, your Britons or Mayans or Ethiopians or what have you. Will we be seeing Genitors more? Honestly, maybe. I think it's just a matter of the top players trying them a bit more often. I, I think they're even already a little bit underutilized. They're fast and they're tanky. They have that four pierce armor now, which is critical. So will this make Genitors, you know, viable or at least more viable? I mean, it doesn't hurt. I mean, it's a 20% uh, food cost decrease. So we'll have to see if the, you know, the janitors can come and uh, sweep up any archers that are lying around. Next is going to be the new sieve, the Bohemians, and they did get hit with the nerf bat just a little bit. First, we can see that blacksmiths and universities cost minus 100 wood. That used to apply to monasteries. That was, in fact, a very important aspect of the bonus. But now it is just completely gone. Your monasteries with bohemians cost 175 wood, like they do with uh, every other civic except Malians, I guess. So this hurts your mine crush a fair bit. You still have the free uh, mining camp upgrades and the villagers, I guess, that are affected by fervor and sanctity. But... No longer will, I think, the Bohemian Monk Rush really be quite as dominating, and it, they'll be more in line with other top Monk Rush civs like Aztecs and Burmese, but eh, it's still probably for the best. But unfortunately for Bohemians, they got a second nerf, and that is to their late game with the Hofnitsa, and these guys got, in fact, a double nerf. First, their base attack has been reduced from 55 to 50, so the regular Bombard Cannon has 40 base attack with, you know, relevant bonus damage. Now the uh, base and even some of the bonus damage of the Hofnitsa has been brought down just a little bit. And in addition, their blast radius was also reduced from 0.85 tiles to 0.8. So a little bit of a nerf right there, but that's still way more than the 0.5 of the Bombard Cannon. So, you know, Hofnitsa, it's still a big upgrade over the Bombard Cannon. You know, you get more damage and you get more splash radius and even a little bit more survivability with one more pierce armor, but they're just not quite as strong and they're not going to be, I think, as much of a siege onager replacement as they are currently, as this unit really is just so overbearing in so many late game situations. So I'd say that that nerf is pretty darn warranted and Bohemians are now just going to be brought a little bit more in line on those closed maps. Uh, the Civ is still going to be totally strong there, don't get me wrong. Like, Bohemians are still a really, really good Civ on closed maps. Uh, they're just not going to be, I think, quite as oppressive. Next is going to be everybody's favorite civilization, the Burmese. So, first thing, we have Battle Elephants gain plus one, plus one armor, just for free. So that means that without any upgrades at all, your Elephants will be having two, three armor. Does this help them against archers in the mid-game? I mean, technically... Also, Howda has been... Uh, reduced back to plus one, plus one. So it's like you kind of double up with these bonuses. So you actually, in the late game, have one more melee armor, uh, which means that, you know, you're going to have some tanky, tanky elephants. But that's not really where Burmese struggle. Like, Burmese elephants are already insanely good in the late game. Is this enough to make them more viable against archer sieves in Castle Age? I don't really think so, to be honest. You just have the issue where one monk will convert an elephant. And because elephants are so expensive, well, it's just so hard to get them up and running. And, you know, pikemen are still super good against them, and that's why the Bengali bonus is so powerful, right? It helps elephants against their two biggest counters, pikemen and monks. But Burmese don't have that. They just get chonkier elephants, which are already really chonky. So I don't think that's going to make too much of a difference. Um, they also got a couple of other changes Burmese did. Uh, Monopore Cavalry is now a little bit cheaper. It was 650 food, 400 gold. Now it's 400 food, 400 gold. So 250 less uh, food for this unique tech. Uh, cavalry get plus 5 attack versus archers. Again, I feel like this is kind of... You're making Burmese stronger where they're already strong. And yes, like in the late game, their cavalry can kill archers. Like, 
that's not an issue. It's mostly Castle Age, Early Imperial Age. And then there was another buff to the Arambai, where their train time was reduced from 21 seconds to 18 seconds. So a little bit of a buff there, 3 seconds less per Arambai. And that is certainly pretty handy. Ever since Arambai got the rework where they now kind of deal splash damage once you have enough of them, uh, because they're, even their missed darts deal full damage, uh, it's just that much more important to have a mass of the unit. So now it's just easier to mass that unit. Does it change the fundamental strengths and weaknesses of the Arambai? Not in the slightest, but just makes getting to them a little bit easier. And I think that, you know, players who are rolling with Burmese are going to be, you know, grateful for that. So overall, Burmese, they did get some buffs. I don't think it's going to change a lot with the civilization. It still, you know, it has its strengths, especially against melee heavy civilizations. Burmese are really good. It's just against archer civs where they struggle so, so much. And I don't really see these changes doing a ton to address that. Next is Cumans, and this is a small change to the Cuman Mercenaries tech. Now it says team members can create five elite Kipchaks per castle. So it used to be that the tech was, okay, all teammates, including yourself, can train 10 free elite Kipchaks. Just one time, 10 Kipchaks, and that's it. Now the elite Kipchaks are, you get five of them per castle. So it's actually a sort of, I guess, continuous effect as opposed to just a one-time thing, because every time you build another castle, you can get another, you know, five free elite Kipchaks. Is this enough to make the tech worth it? Eh, I still don't like it. I'm still not a big fan of it. I'd rather it just be something else, but it's at least a little bit better now. Well, I guess it's actually worse if you have only one castle, but still. Assuming you have several castles across you and your teammates, then I guess it's worth it. It's just, in a team game setting, if you're going Kipchaks, then you don't want your allies going Kipchaks, because then, you know, you're you're doubling up on the same unit when you don't want to be doing that. So, like, say you're a Cuman pocket, and you're making Kipchaks, and your other uh, pocket is Teutons. Well, what's a Teuton player going to do with a bunch of Kipchaks? It's just wasted pop space. So, not the biggest fan of this unique tech, but I guess it's a little bit better now. And as for the overall, you know, play style of Cumans, that's going to be, you know, exactly the same. It's They're, they're still going to be good in the situations that they're good in, areas where they can go for their 2TC boom, and especially go for a lot of Castle Age pressure. Cumans can be really deadly. Oh boy, next is going to be the Incas. And they finally had that awful team bonus of farms built uh, two times faster, or plus 100% faster. That bonus is gone! Now Spearmen and Skirmishers get plus two line of sight. So is that the greatest team bonus in the world? No. But at least it's something, right? And it's honestly pretty useful in 1v1s. You get Spearmen and Skirms that, you know, have really good line of sight. They can uh, better see engagements, potentially. Uh, like with Spearmen, you can see enemy cavalry coming in a bit earlier, and then you can reposition. Same thing with your Skirmishers. Just gives you maybe another second to get into a bit of a better position with these units. So... It's not going to be lighting the world on fire, but hey, it's better than farms built twice as fast. So now Incas, if not having a super powerful team bonus, at least have a relevant team bonus. All civs with elephants, I guess, uh, are getting a little bit of love. That's not actually true. But Khmer also are getting a little bit of a change, and that is going to be a buff to the Ballista Elephant. Now the Castle Age Ballista has uh, 10 attack as opposed to 8 attack uh, from previously. And the elite version has 11 attack as opposed to 9, so plus 2 attack for both the Castle Age and Imperial Age versions of this unit. And remember, this is relevant for Ballista Elephants because their secondary projectile is half of their half the damage of their main attack. So a boost to their base attack is also a boost to the other targets that the bolts pass through. Does this make Ballista Elephants more viable? Uh, maybe, honestly... I mean, when you're working with a unit that has, you know, that low of an attack, like, it does make a difference. I'll be interested to see. Like, plus two attack, it's pretty sizable. Perhaps we could be seeing Ballista Elephants fulfill a similar role to Elephant Archers with the, uh, the South Asian civs now. But it's at least enough of a change that at least it's piqued my interest. So look, be on the lookout for some Ballista Elephant masterpieces in the future. But uh, everything else about Khmer is the same, so you can just play Khmer as you did before, aka not using Ballista Elephants just fine. Next is going to be the Portuguese, and this is one that I uh, had to double check in my testing, but yes, it is a change, and the Portuguese did get a, a an adjustment to the Feitoria. So the Feitoria 
used to produce, and I, I'll put those numbers on screen so you can visually see them, it used to produce 60 wood per minute, 96 food per minute, 42 gold per minute, and 18 stone per minute. Now it produces the same total resources, but the wood and gold values have been switched. So now it's 42 wood per minute, 96 food per minute, 60 gold per minute, and 18 stone per minute. So the upshot of all this is Fatorias are giving you less wood for your camping on water maps, but they are giving you more gold. And Portuguese, you know, you're already saving with gold units. Fatorias kind of, you know, you build them in situations where you don't have a ton of gold perhaps anyway. Well, then, yeah, the, the Fatoria is a little bit better. But as a tool on water maps, it's obviously going to be worse. And in situations where you're going for, like, fast imp into Fatorias to add as sort of your eco substitute that we see a lot on closed maps, that is going to be less powerful because gold already comes in very quickly. And it's harder to have that wood income um, sustained with just fewer villagers compared to, like, you know, 10 gold miners is generally worth more than 10 lumberjacks when you're in, like, a fast imp situation. So... Overall, it's just an adjustment to the Fatoria. It's still going to be used in these situations where it's going to be used. I don't like the design of the building. I never have, but that is the change that has taken place. You're still going to build them in the situations where you built them before. It's just a matter of them being a little bit better or worse. Ooh -hoo -hoo. Next up is going to be the Saracens, and they got some interesting changes. The first one that everyone is talking about is their unique tech. We can see that Zealotry has now become a Castle Age unique tech. Uh, the cost and benefit of it are exactly the same as they were in the last patch. But now Madrasa is gone. Their monks uh, retaining, or you get 33% of the gold cost on the monk back when they die. That nonsense is gone. It was a terrible unique tech. No one ever researched it. Now we have counterweights. It's a new unique tech. It's 650 food and 500 gold. And trebuchets in Mangonel line gain plus 15% attack. That's pretty good. It means that your trebuchets are just a little bit better versus buildings. Remember, both of these uh, units benefit from siege engineers, which, hey, Saracens have access to, because Saracens have access to, like, almost everything. So that's a pretty decent tech, and it means that your siege onagers should be able to one-shot um, elite Mangudai, which is going to be really scary for Mongols players, and uh, bombard cannons as well, because they also have 80 HP, so... Be on the lookout for some Saracen Siege onagers, and then the trebuchets, again, just a little bit more damage against buildings. Uh, careful of your castles. It makes Saracen... Like, Saracen Siege was already really good, right? You're only missing Heavy Scorpion, and I guess the new armored and Siege Elephants, but that's a different story. Uh, now it's going to be even scarier, so the Saracen late game, guys, you better watch out for it, because, I mean, this isn't really a tech we're likely to see a lot in 1v1s, but it's going to be a solid addition to their team games. Now... Of course, everyone is focusing on the counterweights tech, but Saracens did receive one more very relevant change, and that is to the Mameluke. Yes, Mamelukes got a buff. They no longer have the archer armor class. Now, if you're thinking, or Luke, Mamelukes aren't archers, what the heck are you talking about? No, they're not archers. They don't benefit from any archer upgrades. They benefit from cavalry upgrades. However, they did have the archer armor class to make the Mamelukes a little bit weaker against skirmishers, because way back in the day, the devs feared that Mamelukes would just kind of kill everything. Well, now skirmishers don't get any bonus damage, or anything that does bonus damage against archers now no longer gets bonus damage against Mamelukes. So Mamelukes are going to be even stronger now, guys. So yeah, it was kind of silly that, you know, in this day and age with all of the power creep that's happened over the decades that Mamelukes were still taking bonus damage from skirmishers. So that's just no longer a thing. And I mean, guys, look out for that Saracen late game. They're no longer just the uh, fast castle arbs nuking your buildings and all that stuff. The whole camel and siege and late game play has gotten some pretty substantial uh, buffs. And we'll have to see how that... Uh, looks going forward, especially because the first tournament uh, with this DLC is, I believe, the upcoming Arena Tournament. Um, I forget who sponsored it. It's either Draken or John Slow. But maybe we could see a bit more action from Saracens here. It's interesting stuff, guys. Next up is the Sicilianos, the Sicilians, and they got a little bit of a nerf to their Hoburg tech. 
Uh, now it costs 700 food and 600 gold, as opposed to 500 food, 400 gold. So 200 more food, 200 more gold to research this very powerful, unique tech that gives your knights plus one and uh, melee armor plus two pierce armor. This is a good change. Hoberk is one of the best unique techs in the game. It's literally just a second version of plate barding armor that only applies to your knights. But it turns out that double dipping on uh, blacksmith upgrades is really good. Just say hello to things like recurve bow and that ladle. It's literally just like, you know, bracer <laughs> again. Those upgrades are all really good. And because Sicilian knights, they already uh, take less bonus damage from pikemen. They already get a bit more conversion resistance once you research First Crusade. Just making this a little bit more of an expensive transition, I think, is totally fair. However, they did get a small buff to their donjon in Feudal Age. This is pretty much just to coincide with the buff that they gave towers. So now donjons have 1250 HP in Feudal Age, um, as opposed to 1000. So they now get another 250 HP in Feudal Age. Don't see a ton of donjon rushes in Feudal Age, so I don't think that's going to make too big of a difference. But it's still a change nevertheless. Next up, we have the Slavs, and definitely people are talking about some changes with this sieve. Notably, Orthodoxy is gone forever. That that tech has been banished to the, uh, you know, trash bin of Obsidian Arrows and Madrasa and Boiling Oil. <laughs> but yeah, now we have a new tech. It's called Detonets. 400 wood, 200 gold, and it's 40% of castles and towers stone cost replaced with wood. That's pretty interesting. I'll put the numbers up on the screen for you, but it means towers go from costing 50 wood, 125 stone, to now 100 wood and 75 stone. For castles, it means that, well, one, you have to make remember that your first castle is always going to be 650 stone because you need a castle to research the technology. Um, but subsequent castles can cost 260 wood and 390 stone, so take that, Frank Castles. And this is a pretty solid tech, uh, and it boosts Slav's defensive capability by a pretty decent margin. But there's still the caveat that, oh, wait a minute, Slavs don't have Bracer for their castles and towers. And, uh, oh, wait a minute, they also don't. Uh, they also don't have architecture, they don't have keep, they don't have bombard towers, they don't have heated shot, they don't have arrow slits, they don't have treadmill crane. So I wouldn't worry too much about Slavs and their tower and castle spam, uh, but it's still a nice little bit of a buff, and it makes a save that had otherwise really mediocre defenses at least, you know, decent. Does this change where Slavs are good and bad? It makes Slavs a little bit better on more open maps as you can spam some more defensive structures to help keep you safe. So yeah, I mean, I'd say this helps Slavs a little bit. It certainly makes them a more interesting sieve. Uh, but that's uh, all the changes to the Slavs. Our second to last sieve with a change that at least I found is the Tatars. And that change is, of course, the Flaming Camel. Flaming Camel's got a buff, guys. Yes, I checked in the Genie Editor because... I'm like, I wonder if they changed Flaming Camels. Yes, they did. Now Flaming Camels get plus 200 damage versus buildings and plus 25 damage versus siege weapons. They didn't have any bonus damage against either of those things before. Does this make Flaming Camels as good as petards against buildings? No. Does this make them good against buildings in general? Not especially. But it does make them slightly less terrible. You will still never see Flaming Camels unless you're against mass elephants. Like, they are actually really good against mass elephants. If you're playing something like Black Forest and your opponent has a ton of elephants, Flaming Camels are a totally viable unit, just saying. But yeah, other than that, the Flaming Camels are still pretty bad. But they did get a buff. And our final sieve to get a change is the Vietnamese. People have been talking about this one. Their paper money unique tech has been changed. It is no longer give you and your teammates 500 gold, which has always been kind of a joke. Now... The cost has been changed. It used to be 500 food, 300 wood. Now it is 600 wood, 350 gold, but lumberjacks slowly generate gold in addition to wood. This suggestion was thrown around all over the place, and it was a good one. And this essentially turns Vietnamese into Burgundians, but with wood. <laughs> Seriously, it's like Burgundians, they have their eco upgrades available in age earlier and cost less food. Vietnamese, they get their eco upgrades that like, cost no wood, but you have to research them in their appropriate age. And Burgundians, you know, Burgundian vineyards, your farmers generate gold. Vietnamese, their lumberjacks generate gold. It's going to make the sieve even stronger in situations where gold is short. It is 
it, it makes them a really good Forest Nothing sieve for the, the Forest Nothing players out there. And yeah, it's just a decent tech. I mean, you do have to get it in the Imperial Age, and it does have a, it's a pretty sizable upfront cost. But if there's still plenty of wood to chop left on the map, I imagine that if you have 40-ish Lumberjacks, that's like getting another Relic. Not bad. You know, if you imagine the game was going to be lasting another 10 minutes, or more than 10 minutes, then pick it up. Vietnamese already are super good in these sort of grindy late game scenarios, and now they're going to be a little bit better in them. Anyway, guys, that is it for the balance changes that I found. Uh, like I said, if I did miss any, I'll be sure to post them in a pinned comment below. But definitely let me kn guys know in the comments what you think of all these balance changes. What are you the most excited about? And yeah, thank you all so much for watching. Of course, be sure to drop a uh, like on the video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to the channel for more uh, Dynasties of India content, both single player and multiplayer. But of course, you guys are still watching this at the very end of the video. You know that. <laughs> thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time.